How are you, mate? How are you? Good. 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 Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Melissa, and I'm the State Manager for the Advertising Council Australia, formerly known as the Comms Council. And I'd like to welcome you all to this sellout, long-awaited event, an evening with the one and only John Steele. I had to say that to make him shy. Um, before we kick off with the formal proceedings, we wish to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land we are meeting on, the Wajuk Noongar people. We acknowledge and respect their continuing culture and the contribution they make to this life um, and this region. A couple of housekeeping rules. Um, if you could please have your phones on silent for the next hour and a half, we should be finishing around about eight, depending on how many questions you have at the end. Um, the toilets are directly across the Champagne Lounge if you exit the store. The exit is right here in case of an emergency. Um, please ensure you validate your parking tickets with any, with any of the Palace Cinemas staff at either the bar across the other way or the one that you were just at. Because uh, if you don't, uh, you're going to have to be taking out a small loan to pay for your parking. Um, John and Samilka will be answering some of the questions that you registered upon um, your registration. Um, but we'll be opening up the floor at the end for some questions. So please hold on to your thoughts and your questions till then. And I'm sure I don't have to say to this audience that you don't have to be shy. Um, so, um, an intro to the ACA and the APG, just for those of you in the room who are not um, familiar with us. So, the Advertising Council is the peak body for Australia's leading advertising agencies. Our purpose is to foster the long-term prosperity of the industry. And our vision is to make advertising the most valued professional service in Australia. The Account Planning Group is one of the ACA subcommittees, and it was established in 2003. The APG was set up to support strategic planners within the industry, as there was a feeling that there were a lot of programs and awards that acknowledged creativity, but nothing specific to planners. So the aim of the APG is to promote the value of planning to business, brands, and culture. In recent years, the APG has undergone some change and is currently in the process of rebuilding itself. So this is the first of what we hope will be many more successful APG events in the WA market. On that note, I'd like to call upon Samilka, Strategy Director at 303 Mullen Low, and our WA APG representative to introduce our guest speaker. Thanks for not trying to pronounce my last name. Much appreciated. So good evening and thank you all so much for coming. Um, it was slightly over a year ago that I got a phone call from Jez Riley, um, who was at Market Force at the time, um, to join him and Anthony Buccini, seated right here from Gatecrasher, and also um, Paul Yol, uh, to discuss how we were going to breathe life back into the WA chapter of the APG. And we went out and we asked the planning community what they wanted um, and at the top of the list was opportunities to be inspired and to learn from the world's greats. So uh, we really wanted to make that happen, and I really hope that this is just the first of many of those. I want to say a big thank you to Sarah Newman, the director of uh, APG in London, who gave me the idea to get in touch with John. I wouldn't have thought to, and I wouldn't have probably uh, had the balls, if I can say it, to do it, um, if it wasn't for her. Um, also, a big thank you to the Ad Council and the Australian APG community for being so supportive um, of making this happen. And also, last but not least, a really big thank you to John for saying yes. So let me tell you a little bit about John. He accidentally, um, and almost against his own will, fell into planning. Um, his undergrad was in geography, which basically made uh, advertising a little bit of a tangent. Um, and if it wasn't for the chosen graduate program applicant uh, who at the last moment decided to ditch this opportunity to join um, the ad agency in favour of becoming a trader, um, John may have never been trained by the likes of Peter Field, um, who we all now know as the godfather of um, effectiveness. Uh, he may also have never had the chance to realise just how well suited he was to advertising, um, so much so that he was invited to join the agency board at, like, 26, because that's what happens. Um, he may not have been shipped to the US to head up and grow what came to be one of the largest and most influential planning departments in American advertising. And again, if that first choice hadn't been uh, 
or if the first choice hadn't given up his spot. Um, Sir Martin Sorrell may not have made John the director of the WPP Fellowship, where he spent the last 15 years of his career nurturing future leaders for the group. For those of you sitting in the audience wondering, just like I did at the time, what is it? It's a fellowship. That sounds like Lord of the Rings. Um, apparently, it's quite similar, except um, obviously Sir Ian McKellen didn't make it as part of the inner circle, but they've got elves and hobbits and wizards. and It's fun, I'm told. So there are many, many accolades to John's name, and we would be here all night if, you're, if I was going to go through all of them. But suffice it to say that he is the equivalent of that really annoying kid in your physics class who manages to ace every subject every year, um, win all of the awards, and then graduate uh, from high school at a sort of ripe old age of 11. So I think uh, having a cup of tea, reading his LinkedIn profile is probably going to get you up to speed to some of his most important achievements, which is why I wanted to spend a couple of minutes on... Um, I forgot to click the clicker. This is John the Planner. <laughs> And this is John the human. The first thing that struck me about John is how calm and unassuming he is. For somebody of his stature, I expected a little bit of ego, but there's none. Um, much like the people that he's drawn to and indeed the people that he identifies as great planners, he has some quirks. So as already mentioned, his undergrad is in geography. And although that may not be so odd in the UK, if he sort of pulled a move like that here, he'd now be a really accomplished surveyor or a cartographer. Um, he's British to a T with his love of cricket. In fact, it was the ashes of 2006, well before the Sandpapergate scandal that ruined the Australian cricket team's um, uh, name, which brought him to our shores. Um, and it was the eternal Perth sunshine that kept him here. He's a photographer and a painter. He's humble, he's gracious, he's incredibly kind and thoughtful, and he is certainly not an extrovert. Um, he is the only person I know who has been successfully sued by a dog. So ask him about that later. And perhaps as an extra penance, John has been involved with a number of conservation and wildlife organisations for decades. The one behind me, oh sorry, no that one is the Sheldrick Wildlife Trust in Kenya, who among other things run an orphan rescue and rehabilitation program for both elephants, rhinos and giraffes. Last but not least, he is a considered genius, and unlike some who like to impress their intellect on others with lofty, hard to grasp ideas and complicated jargon, John articulates his position and his thoughts, his own sort of worldly knowledge in everyday terms, using language that a six-year-old would understand. And that, in my mind, is the telltale sign of a brilliant strategist, someone who can distill complexity into simplicity, who puts the quality of their craft ahead of their own ego, and who can effortlessly relate to everyone. It's my absolute pleasure to introduce you to the benevolent Lord of the Rings, John Steele. very bright. Uh, thank you, Milka, for, um, for, for the invitation and for your kind introduction. And thanks to all of you. I, th I think you are out there. I can see vaguely. Thank you for coming. It would have been very embarrassing if it was just me and Milka having a chat in this <laughs> empty theatre. Um, now, I have to admit, before every presentation I've ever made you know, throughout my career, I've been nervous, whether it's to one person or 5,000, to friends or strangers. And Tonight I was perhaps a bit more nervous than normal because I haven't done this for a couple of years. It's actually the first time I've worn a suit and big boy shoes for <laughs> since I retired from WPP. Um, but I, I did realise as I was driving in, no matter what I say, I could offend everybody in this room and at least tonight I can't get fired. <laughs> um, but anyway, I'm 59 years old and for the uh, numerate among you, you'll realise that means I was born just 16 years after the end of the Second World War. I was in my teens before I saw colour television, so my childhood memories of important people and events are strangely all in black and white. Um, I started my first job at, at BMP in London in October 1984. Now, if I can see it, can you raise your hands if you were born after October 1984? <laughs> yes, I, I feared that might be the case. Um, and I'll bet many of you now have job titles that didn't exist 
when I worked at, at BMP or, or Goodby, I won't go any further of raise your hands if you were born after 1989, but anyway. So, so my first book about advertising, Truth, Lies and Advertising, I wrote in 1997. And to put that in context, Mark Zuckerberg was 13 the year that was published. Um, Amazon was only a couple of years old and Twitter wasn't going to be founded for another decade. And I say all that and I ask the question about when you were born because a lot of what I say tonight, in saying what I'm going to say tonight, I think I run the risk of, um, of you dismissing me as an old fart who's probably incapable of saying anything useful or relevant because the world I grew up in no longer exists and the industry that I've spent my entire career in has changed beyond all recognition. And I may be old but hopefully not yet senile and yes a lot of things have changed and many of them for the better and I embrace that change. As a communicator I'm very interested in the things that have changed but I'm also equally if not more interested in the things that haven't changed over that time um, that haven't changed and that won't be changing anytime soon and first and foremost among those are human nature human emotion and human instinct and I'll bet that even though most of us were probably brought up in different decades at opposite ends of the planet and regardless of the presence of the internet and mobile phones and, and such like we had more in common as teenagers than we had differences between us and I think the similarities between teenagers today and teenagers who lived several thousand years ago are still quite large and, and quite profound and, and we ignore, we as a communications industry embrace all that change, think <coughs> everything's changed and, and don't pay any regard to those timeless attitudes and emotions and behaviours at our peril. Now, I'm not going to talk long now. Smilker asked me to just talk for 10 minutes or so up front because we want to get to the questions that you've asked and to have a, a two-way discussion. Um, but what I did want to do at the start is just make a few general points about strategy in our industry to introduce some of the themes that we might get a little deeper into in the course of questions and, and discussion. And I'd like to start by showing a short film. Um, it's appropriately in black and white. And it's a, a film that the agency I work for in London produced back in 1985 for a newspaper. An event seen from one point of view gives one impression. Seen from another point of view, it gives quite a different impression. But it's only when you get the whole picture you can fully understand what's going on. Credit for it, um, but I show it for two reasons. First of all, because I think it's one of the best pieces of advertising I've ever seen, and, and second, because for me it really encapsulates the role of the strategist, which is to provide perspective. Perspective that would be lacking if clients simply told agencies what to do, perspective that would be lacking if creative people were told, here's five million dollars, just go spend it however you want. Um, dream on. <laughs> um, um, but as, as Stanley Pollitt, one of the founders of account planning, said of his discipline, you can't make intelligent decisions about advertising without at least some degree of consumer involvement. And, and planning as a discipline was designed to bring real people into the process at every stage uh, to balance those client and creative perspectives. Now, I say real, I, I prefer real people to consumer when we're talking about these sort of things. I, I've never liked the word consumer because it almost implies that as a species we spend all our time consuming or thinking about consuming and I would hope that's not entirely true. Um, but, but real people. Ultimately effective marketing, um, effective marketing communications is about creating active connections between these real people and brands. And when I say active connections, I mean, I mean in the sense of getting them to, to think something different and um, that in turn leading them to do something different. And it can be the other way around too. You can get them to do something different and then think something different as a consequence. We can talk about that for hours. But, but really what I'm talking about here is action. 
real action, not that sort of create a buzz, start a movement, join the conversation, follow us on Facebook, drive social engagement, give bloggers a reason to get excited bollocks. I'm talking about action. I'm talking about buying things. I'm talking about buying them more often. I'm talking about being prepared to pay more for them. And, and that in turn gives the clients more revenue, more share, more margin, more profit. And call me old fashioned, but I think those things are still important. Um, if any of you, if you, if you get the chance, read Steve Harrison's new book um, called Can't Sell, Won't Sell. Um, Steve Harrison's a former copywriter with Harrison, is his agency, Trout and Wonderman. Um, but he attacks our industry's obsession with social purpose at the expense of actually trying to sell things to the extent that he believes a lot of the industry's forgotten how to sell things um, and has actually forgotten that that's what it's supposed to be doing in the first place. Um, and I have a lot of sympathy with his point of view. But to achieve these objectives of, of increased sales and share and margin and profit and to do it consistently, someone has to be responsible for getting into the heads of those that our advertising is meant to be um, aimed at and affecting, understanding their relationship with the brand and its competitors and its category, and, and figuring out how that relationship can be changed, strengthened, um, sustained. Now, when I entered the industry, that person was the planner, and in some agencies, it still is, but to a lesser extent. Now, the planner's role is to gather relevant research and, and conduct primary research, primary research to fill any gaps that exist, to inform all the key, key decisions during strategic development, during creative development, and an evaluation of the work. And the job's to stimulate creative ideas, but also make sure that those creative ideas stay relevant to the task and to the target. And as Stephen King, who was the, not the horror writer, the other Stephen King, the planning director at JWT in London put it, this is a process of creative imagination subjected to critical control. Now I worked with a guy called Jeff Goodby in San Francisco, who many years later described me and his planning department as his conscience. Um, his conscience in that we kept the work honest to the brand promise, we kept the work honest in the broader cultural context, and we kept the work honest in the deeper, timeless human context that I talked about earlier. And, and it, insight, true insight, lives at the confluence of those three things, brand, cultural context, human context, and there's an element of each in great insight. But it seems to me that our industry no longer has that conscience. It says it does. Um, there aren't many agencies or clients who wouldn't say that strategy is not who, who would say that strategy is not important. But I wonder, are they really doing the right thing? Are all of us in this room really doing the right thing by our brands? Now it's said that if you drop a frog, you've heard this before. If you drop a frog into a saucepan of boiling water, it'll jump out to save itself. If you put a frog in a saucepan of cold water, it will swim around happily. You warm the water up, um, but the frog won't notice it's getting warmer. And if you bring it up to boiling point, the frog will simply just boil to death. I think that advertising today is the frog in the saucepan and that the temperature is rising. And it's rising because clients and agencies are no longer the partners that they used to be. It's rising because clients no longer pay agencies enough for agencies to attract and keep the best talent. Um, it's rising because planners no longer do much, if any, of their own research. I see an entire generation now of Google planners who think involving real people in the process means doing a Google search or going large on SurveyMonkey. Um, even if they want to do their own research, to the extent that I did as a practicing planner, they probably wouldn't have the time because their departments are grossly understaffed and they work across too many clients to be able to have in-depth knowledge about any of them. The temperature's rising because agencies are no longer training planners. I spent my first two years working for some of the best people in the business, learning quantitative research skills, being taught how to moderate focus groups and interviews, spending time in the creative department so I knew how to, to write ads and tell the difference between good briefing and bad briefing. I spent months in the media department, I attended client meetings, I worked in a client marketing department for four or five months. Few agencies do that today. And Smilka mentioned the WPP Fellowship. Fellows spent three years on that program, working across different agencies, different disciplines, different markets. And if budgets had allowed, I would have extended it to four years of training to include a year with a client as well before they took on permanent senior roles with one of WPP's agencies. But back to the frog in the water, in case you've forgotten. 
because the, and the temperature is rising also because clients prefer in-house planners and independent researchers. In my opinion, in-house planning is a disaster waiting to happen. Um, as in-house, you lack the perspective that being in an outside agency offers. And one benefit of agency planners working on multiple accounts, even if they're too thinly spread, is that at least it gives them a broader view of the world. Um, like many of you, I'm sure I, I've lost count of the number of times I learned something on one piece of business that I was able to apply to another. And it could be on baked beans that I put, applied to a car account or something on a car account that I was able to apply to disability insurance. Everywhere you go, you're meeting people. Every focus group I conducted in America over a 10 year period, I started by asking people to talk about the American dream. And it, because we started that conversation with that broad context, it enabled me over time to, to be able to sort of track at least mentally and qualitatively the mood of that country, but also to understand where the particular category I was working in fit with, with that, that general discussion. Um, independent researchers in this era of accountability supposedly bring objectivity to strategic and creative development. Well, I spit on objectivity. Um, good strategy and excellent creative work require some element of objectivity, but only as much as common sense and professionalism demand. Um, what good strategy and great creative work require more than anything is subjectivity and intuition. And, and the people doing the research should have those qualities and apply them to their craft. The temperature's rising because of a creeping efficiency mindset, as a result of which both agencies and clients are less concerned with doing the right thing than in doing things the right way. It's rising because we have too many specialists and not enough generalists. Maybe that's because, especially in the US and Australia, we have too many people who followed a narrow vocational academic path of advertising, marketing and commerce and bring nothing different to their agency or client role. The temperature's rising because of short-termism, because the life expectancy of CMOs is short and results are measured by the quarter rather than in the long term. You've got to be seen to be making a difference, any difference, not necessarily the right difference. And it's rising because we're increasingly being seduced by the technical possibilities of the digital world. The day I heard Mark Reed, WPP's new CEO, say that the future was all about data-driven creativity was the day I decided to retire. <laughs> <laughs> so here's a question for you, one of life's eternal questions. Why do dogs lick their balls? <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, dogs lick their balls because they can. And like dogs licking their balls, so too we as an industry are doing things because technology allows us to, rather than because they're necessarily the right things to do. The water's very, very hot. And yes, there are exceptions to all of the things I've just talked about, but I'd be surprised if everyone in this room isn't at least familiar with some of them, if not most of them. Um, and if you haven't experienced limits on your work and your creativity and your effectiveness because of them. And they have to change. Well, this business will fail to attract and keep the best people, and the quality of the solutions we offer our clients will be further reduced. And that's a warning to both agency and client folk in this room tonight and beyond. And that's all I'm going to say up front. And now it's time for questions with Smoker. <laughs> I think. <laughs> um, I thank you for the visual analogies. Uh, John, I certainly pictured both the frog and the dog. Um, so we asked all of you guys to pose a question at the start when you registered, um, and the idea being that we would um, uh, sort of curate a series of questions which were, or themes rather, um, that captured most of what everybody was interested in hearing about. Um, and so I, I've done that to the best of my ability, I feel, and that hopefully there's a sort of logical sequence that, um, that, will, that will go with that. Um, and then there were some questions which uh, didn't quite fit necessarily, so I'm going to call those out individually um, as well. And then after that, we'll um, open it up to you guys, so all of the things that we haven't answered that you'd like answered, um, you know, like the dog, so we knew <laughs> we can talk about. So... Um, 
I will begin with uh, at the beginning, which is uh, the aim of advertising. So uh, joining the dots um, is an analogy that um, you have used before, and the idea is that the, that advertising should really get the viewer um, curious enough to want to invest time in looking at the ads and in thinking about the message. Can you talk a bit about that, um, and also in terms of how biases may impact what we say and how we say it? Right. Um, some, some of you may have heard of a guy called Jeremy Bullmore. Um, he's a, a fantastic, um, fantastic advertising brain. He was the creative director and chairman of the agency formerly known as J. Walter Thompson in London. Um, he's now in his 90s, he still works for WPP, and he's actually one of the smartest people I ever met in the business, um, and one, one of the great privileges of working with WPP in London for all the years was that he was just 10 metres down the corridor, and if ever I had a problem that was hard to solve, I could ask him. But I once asked him for a definition of advertising, or a sort of blueprint for good advertising, and he said, it's the invention of a stimulus that creates a predetermined reaction among a complicit audience. And he apologised beforehand, he said, it's a little unwieldy, but you do those three things right, you're not going to go far wrong. And the, the idea of the complicit audience is, is very, very important, and it's what I mean when I talk about joining the dots. You, you, can't, give, you can't tell the audience what to conclude. There's a lot of a lot of advertising, a lot of communication is based on a sort of a broadcast sensibility where you think if I tell them and I tell them loud enough and I tell them often enough, they will do what I command them to. And it, it doesn't work that way, at least not well. Uh, great advertising leaves a few dots for people to join up for themselves so that they draw the conclusion and having drawn the conclusion, it's a much more powerful piece of communication. Now, I'll give you a couple of examples that have nothing whatsoever to do with advertising. I, I recently received a letter from my bank, and it's a bank that I've been with for 40 years in the UK. And I opened the letter, and there on the first line it said, Dear Valued Customer. Now, I, I'd love, I would have loved to have been in the meeting where they were discussing how to make John feel like a valued customer. I know, let's address him. Dear Valued Customer, that'll do it. Well, as you can imagine, it had exactly the opposite effect. Um, I also... You know, a few years ago for a presentation, went around collecting examples of the little jars that you find in coffee bars you know, for tips. And you, know, you, you go into one and there's a sign that says tips. Well, of course it's a bloody tip. It's a glass jar full of coins. But, it, but when you just see the word tips on it, it's almost like an order. Um, you, know, you will put money in here. Yeah, sure, after I've already paid $6 for a cup of coffee. You know, I'd love to. But you compare that to the, the coffee bar down the road, which is owned by a couple of surfers who, on their tip jar, say Mexico 2016. <laughs> you know, and you're, you're sort of living vicariously as part of their surfing adventure by, <laughs> by put dropping coins in. Well, my, my favorite was the one on Bay Road in, in Claremont where it says, good tippers make great lovers. <laughs> I'd put notes into that one. <laughs> But, anyway, but that's, 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 what, that's what we mean by, by joining the dots and, and being a complicit audience. Yeah. And if I'm waffling too much, tell me to shut up. <laughs> I, and I didn't answer your question about bias. No. Sorry. <laughs> so I'm trying to avoid it. But, but I, as for bias, I think it is the strategist, tr strategist's job to identify bias at both ends of the spectrum, from the client end of the spectrum to the, the target audience end of the spectrum and just figure out how to arrange the dots to remove that bias. Are you saying the clients are biased? Yes, I mean, we, we, we'll, we'll talk more, but obviously they're biased when they, when they spend 24 hours a day, seven days a week thinking about their brands. We'll, we'll talk more about this later, but yes, of course they're biased. Everybody, everybody's biased. That's the point of that Guardian commercial. You're all prejudiced. You know, I've watched that Guardian commercial hundreds of times. Every time I watch it, I think the skinhead's going to beat the old guy up. One of these days, he's going to. Somebody's going to slip a version into the presentation where the skinhead does just kick the shit out of the old guy. Yeah. Got you. Anyway. Okay. Um, in your book, Truth Lies in Advertising, um, there are a couple of quotes from Howard Gossage that I really like. One is, advertising is not a right, it's a privilege. 
and our first duty is not to the old sales curve, it is to the audience. Can you please talk us through what he meant? Um, for anybody who doesn't know, Howard Gossage was a guy who ran an advertising agency in San Francisco in the 1950s. And it was in an old fire station in San Francisco, and it was back in the days before television. His agency never actually produced a TV commercial. His work was all print and radio. Um, but, but Gossage was a brilliant guy who most people in the industry have never heard of, um, at least until Steve Harrison, who I mentioned earlier, wrote a book about him, which is fantastic also. Um, he'd be a good person to invite sometime. Anyway, um, I don't get commission for that. But, but, but Gossage would have loved the internet. And, and he, I mean, for example, in his print ads, he always used to put a coupon, but it wasn't a coupon saying sort of a 99 cent burger or, you know, a dollar off. It was a, a coupon that invited some, that sort of put a forward a point of view and asked somebody to share their point of view. So he was creating a sort of a two-way dialogue using classic old print advertising. Um, and I, I once made a presentation about digital media and its possibilities using entirely words and phrases that came from Howard Gossage, at the end of which all these digital people were coming up and congratulating me on my knowledge of it. And I, and I said, well, OK, I'm going to come clean now. All of, all of this presentation was written by a guy who died in 1957. Um, never saw the internet, never had anything to do with it, but, but was prescient about its, um, its possibilities. Um, advertising is not a right, it's a privilege. Yeah, I, I think what he means by that is that it's not our job to talk at people, it's our, our job to create something that, that causes them to pay enough attention to care and to give a shit about what we're, we're talking about. Um, he also said something like, people pay attention to what interests them and sometimes that's advertising. It's our job in advertising to produce work that's distinctive enough um, for people to pay attention and, and then make sure that we say something relevant enough to have them react, have them react um, the way that uh, we want them to. Um, and then the second one you mentioned, uh, our first duty isn't to the old sales curve, it's to the audience. What he doesn't mean by that is that sales don't matter. What he does mean is that you, if, you, if you don't create the right relationship with the audience first, you know, what you want to do to the sales curve is irrelevant because you, you, without that connection, you're never, you're never going to get there. And you asked me to bring along a couple of examples of, of work to su support some of these points. And I, I just want to show you another piece of film, um, which is from my San Francisco years when we worked for the Partnership for a Drug-Free America. Now, there's a couple of points I want to make about this. The, the, the first is you have to consider this film in the context of about 10 years of previous advertising, all of which had fe featured sort of pillars of society wagging their fingers, and talking to kids who might take drugs and saying, just say no, including Nancy Reagan, first lady of the time, just say no. And, and we, we went out and talked to kids in rough neighborhoods that were riddled with drugs and, you know, we, we did our research in East Oakland and South Central Los Angeles and in, you know, the, the more dangerous parts of New York and Chicago and so on. And in almost every piece of research we did, the kids would look at that stuff and go, it's all very fine them saying that, but they don't live the life we lead. They, they don't run the gauntlet of the dangerous people we have to pass on the way to and from school every day. They just don't get it. And long story short, let, I'll show you the film and then tell you how it worked. teacher tells us all we gotta do is just say no. And the other day, a policeman came to our class talking about say no too. Well, my teacher doesn't have to walk home to this neighborhood. And maybe the dealers are scared of the police. But they're not scared of me. And they sure don't take no for an answer. Kevin Scott and all the other kids who take the long way home. We hear you. Don't give up. 
So in that situation, our, our duty to the end objective wasn't best served by telling the audience, say no. And actually, it wasn't best served by talking to that audience of young kids who were the target of the drug trade. It was broadening it, broadening it and talking instead to people in the community who had the power to do something about it. And one of the major effects that that campaign had was sort of mobilizing both community and police resources against the dealers um, and, and making people understand the kind of pressures that the kids were under. To the kids it was great because you know, their response was at last, like, people get it, they understand how tough this is and, and that meant a great deal. We got a message from Bill Clinton when we ran that saying that he cried when he watched it. I think he cried easily but I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> So Daniel Kahneman um, has, uh, in his book Thinking Fast and Slow, he uh, he's sort of popularised this idea of System 1 and System 2 thinking. System 1 being that uh, sort of more intuitive, largely subconscious um, mode used to process kind of the majority of what we do. So some people, I think, ascribe a number like 95% of what we do, but it's, it's irrelevant. It's like most of the things that we do, we think, we feel, tend to get processed in this automated part of our brain which also um, houses um, our emotions and the system two is that kind of more slower deliberative um, uh, kind of um, an analytical and consciously uh, effortful mode of reasoning about the world and so um, people have talked about the fact that the way that we experience brands um, generally tends to happen in that kind of system one mode of thinking um, but that things like surveys and focus groups um, tend to force people into the system two side of thinking, which is you know we're, we're asking them how would you you know how would you respond to this particular situation? So they have to sit there and think about it. So they go into that kind of effortful, conscious um, thought process. And so therefore, when it comes to com consumer research, or by and large the majority of the research that we do, um, it te we tend to sort of capture, assess and analyse system one thinking in that kind of system two, um, using system two tools. So what do you make of that and do you think there's a way around that? Well, I, I agree that most of our interaction, most of our, our most important interactions with communication and with brands happen at the more emotional, subconscious level. And I also agree that much of the research that's done happens at that more sort of logical, um, deliberate, analytical um, level. And that sort of research, in my opinion, is a complete waste of, of time and money. Um, I take issue with the fact that qualitative research operates at the, the sort of logical and analytical level. It shouldn't. I mean, it does when it's done badly. Um, but. 90% of it is done badly, so I suppose you, know, you, you could say, yeah, qualitative research is guilty of that. But it doesn't have to be. Now, I, when I think of all the, the best creative tools I had at my disposal in my years of, of planning, the most useful one for me was qualitative research. It was having the opportunity to go out and talk to people I would never otherwise meet, never otherwise have conversations about brands and categories and how they fit into their lives. But for me, it was no more than a guided conversation. The, the major criticism of, of focus groups of qualitative research is it's not reliable, it's not projectable. Well, no shit, Sherlock, it's not supposed to be. It's, um, it, if I go out and do 10 focus groups, I can go all across the country and do you know one in every major city. I'm only looking for one person to say one thing that acts as a lightning rod for all that you know, electrical storm of information that's going on above us. And I just need somebody to articulate something in a simple and interesting way that I can see affect the others in the room and that for me succeeds in encapsulating what I've been trying to, to articulate but, but can't. Um, I've seen qualitative researchers go into room with discussion guides five, ten pages long. I mean, the discussion guides are longer than the research reports. Um, but Howard Gossage was very fond of quoting um, Saki, I think he's the Japanese writer, who, who once said, if baiting a mouse trap with cheese, be sure to leave room for the mouse. 
and the best research has to leave room for people to say what they want to say and has to leave room for, for what they're feeling. And I would very often start a conversation in a focus group and then leave the room and leave the, leave the respondents to it. Um, I'd, I'd maybe have five words written on a little piece of card that reflected the areas I wanted to cover in the course of the evening. I don't care what order I cover them. Um, I don't care if one of those areas proves so useless that we're past it in two minutes because something else that I think might be, you know, not, not take too much time ends up taking 45 minutes and it's a, it's a really rich vein of information. But I, I also, you know, I'm less interested in what people say and more in, in how they say it. Are they sitting back with their arms folded? Are they leaning forward and engaged? Are they smiling when they look at a piece of work? Um, are they are they sort of in agreement with the people around them? Are they are they wanting to fight with the people around them? Um, I use a lot of projective techniques where you know people will come into the room and there's paper and there's wax crayons and there's magazines for them to take pictures out of and so on. But all of these are things that, that I can use if I need to to get them sort of more in touch with their initial and emotional reactions and and stop them from being over analytical and too comprehensive and feeling like they've got too professional in their answers. And I, I, I did bring one example of this with me, um, which is some work I did with Porsche years ago, where, where Porsche had told us when they briefed the agency for this pitch that the problem was that people didn't really appreciate the, the quality of the engineering of this vehicle. They, they didn't really understand that this was a race-bred automobile and we, I mean, we're listening to it and we're thinking, no, that's just not true. People understand this. They get it. Um, we don't need to tell them that. There's something else that's stopping them from buying it. And, and I was doing this one focus group where I, uh, the, the people I'd got in the room were people I'd recruited to, to, to have always wanted to own a sports car, to believe that Porsche is the best sports car money can buy, to now have the money to be able to buy that sports car, but they hadn't. Right? It was a pretty difficult recruit. <laughs> but but I, I've got eight of these guys in the room, and I give them a piece of paper, and on the piece of paper is a drawing, and the drawing is two cars at a stoplight. One of them's a 911, and the other is a car. And I said to them all, right, you've got to imagine, you're sitting in this car, you're stopped at the light, the drivers are checking each other out as they do at the stoplight, and here's a thought bubble coming out of the top of your car, what are you thinking? So everybody sort of scribbled away, and I go around, and there are some fairly benign answers. And I get to this one guy who shows his picture. If you could just put it up there. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was amazing the effect it had in the room, because the moment he showed that, everybody else in the room just leaned forward and went, oh, shit, that is, that's so what I wanted to say. But I thought you were paying me the $100 tonight to be professional and consider <laughs> And then they just went off on one about what wankers Porsche drivers are. And, and, and I could hardly shut them up. And, and like three months later, there I was in the boardroom in Germany, presenting to this table full of guys in dark pinstripe suits. And I, and I, and I, I got a slide carousel. This is a real Don Draper era. I got a slide carousel in my hand. And I said, right, I can do this presentation one of two ways. I've got a 60, sli I've got a 60 slide presentation or I've got a one slide presentation, and on the one slide is written one word that I think defines your problem and starts to suggest the solution. And I said, which would you like? I hope people have had the one slide version of it. <laughs> so so I, I gave the sort of introduction I gave to you about the group and what people, and then I put that slide up. And all my partners had told me, don't for Christ's sake show that <laughs> slide. And, and in the moment, there was like a, a moment of silence after I put it up and I realised the reason they didn't want me to show it was that everybody around the table was a Porsche driver. <laughs> so I'd basically gone into their boardroom and said, you're all assholes. But anyway, they, 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 they took it right on the chin and started talking about all the things that people had done against them, perfect strangers treating them badly because of the car they were driving. And they still in Porsche talk about the asshole factor as something that has to be overcome in any communication they do and that people have to like the brand more before they consider buying it. And it was one person in one focus group, but you've got to, un you've got to unlock that emotional subconscious level. And sometimes a kid's wax crayon 
So I'm going to stick with the theme of research, um, and maybe if you can talk a bit about the role of, um, of research and measurement in creative development. So I'd say that many marketers find it difficult to trust the creative team to just kind of go, yeah, you guys know what you're doing, just go and do it. Um, uh, and sometimes there's good reason for that. So there's uh, often a lot of money at stake, or sometimes it's their career on the line. So. Um, there are, you know, there's a lot of weight that's given to numbers, and that's even at concepting stage. So things like words that are used or votes, you know, people are being asked to vote on something, or, um, you know, heartbeat and um, pupil dilation. All of these things get kind of converted into hard numbers, um, and and um, sliced and diced, and, and so you can see how an ad, you know, there's various points of the ad where you know things work or don't work, or and. Uh, Bill Burnback, so this is one of the things that um, uh, I also read in your book, was that you know, he, he believed in the power of an idea, that, sorry, he believed that the power of an idea lay in its wholeness, and that you couldn't just cut it up into little bits and substitute parts. The moment you started doing that, you would create basically bland advertising. Um, so I just wanted to ask your thoughts on when and how we should be uh, measuring um, creative effectiveness. I always like um, quoting Leonardo da Vinci in um, in creative meetings. He's got you know he's got a decent reputation. Um, wasn't an ad man by, by trade, but he once said, "It's by logic we prove." Well, thank you very much. Um, it's by logic we prove, but by intuition we discover. And there's a time for data, and there's a time for intuition, but it's rarely simultaneously. Um, I think if, if you're right that there's when there's a lack of trust between client and, and creative people, it's a terrible indictment of the relationship. Um, best work I've ever been associated with, we've always had clients come along with us every step of the way. So they're part of our initial research. They're drawing conclusions at the same time we are. They're discussing, pro they're identifying problems that need to be overcome at the same time we are. We even used to have uh, clients come and sit in the creative director's room as teams were showing their first their ideas for the first time and that was for real it wasn't a choreographed thing but but through the client seeing the creative director dismissing ideas out of hand because they're self-indulgent or they're technique based and there's no idea in them it does tend to increase their level of faith in the um, in the, the in the process but you know what what Birnbach always wanted was for the whole of an ad to be greater than the sum of its parts and I, I think today too often the whole is, is less than the sum of the parts because of that slicing and dicing that you talk about. Um, and I've often very early on in creative development research found problems with ads where, where the, the whole thing appears not to work and people just dump all over an idea and the clients sort of ready to hang themselves in the back room in the research um, because they've got to start all over again and, and it's my job to figure out why it's not working and very often it's just that there's, there's something going wrong in the first line of copy that people don't quite understand there's a word they're tripping up on or and because they don't understand the first line then they're playing catch up so they don't understand the rest of the ad because they're always five seconds behind trying to figure out what had just happened and because they don't understand it, they don't like it, the whole idea is done. Um, but actually all you need to do is change that first line of copy or maybe change the music track or there's a minor change can sometimes make the greatest difference. I believe wholeheartedly in, in, in using qualitative research to understand how people are affected um, by a piece of advertising and to, to improve it. Um, and I, 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 I have no faith in quantitative copy testing whatsoever. Um, the, the best client relationships I had in the US, were they, most of them used copy testing, but they would only ever copy test rough cuts or finished commercials. They relied totally on us getting the decisions right at the qualitative stage, and then using, using copy testing just to, to sort of set a level, but do it with finished films or rough cuts where you've got the benefit of 
of casting, of editing, of direction, of film quality, and it's not some people trying to judge based on some stupid cartoon. Um, so if, if it were, I mean, if it were my money, I would never spend it on quantitative copy testing, um, and and I I reckon I would have sort of a 95 to 98 percent success rate with with judging whether based on qualitative research, based on whether the ad has the potential to fulfill its objectives or not. So if we start with the premise that the whole point of an ad is to get people to um, to think of your brand uh, on the news writers, um, it could be argued that the connection between the ad and the brand is paramount. That's kind of obvious, sorry. So, um, Mark Ritson in particular talks a lot about um, codifying everything, is, is like the phrase he uses a lot, which is literally using those kind of fortified key brand assets like logos or characters or colours or whatever it may be, everywhere that that brand appears. So whether it's shop front or it's the car or it's the packaging or the ad. Um, and that would therefore um, sort of drive distinctiveness. Every time you see those elements together, you subconsciously know that that's the brand, and uh, and, and there would be that connection between. And so recall would be improved, and um, uh, yeah, and that connection would be improved. So in your book, you talk about how um, and just sorry, I know I've mentioned this book a few times, but that's because the, the themes that are coming out were kind of discussed quite a bit um, in there as well. So in your book, you talk about how creatives dread having to sort of put that logo somewhere because it messes with the art of the thing. So I just wanted to ask you a little bit about your experience and how, you know, if you have any tips around how to get creative with, you know, putting the product in the middle. <laughs> All that, yeah. Um, so now I can piss off the entire creative community and Mark Ritson, who's much smarter than I am. Um, but I, let, let's start with what Ritson says about um, brand assets. Um, I think the best campaigns are inseparable from the brand. In, in the, and I, what I mean by that is that you can't experience the campaign without feeling the brand and you can't experience the brand without being reminded of the campaign and when you've got everything right that's what happens so I, I agree with him wholeheartedly on on that but I do think you have to be careful when you start talking about the four to five distinctive brand assets distinctive in whose opinion um, because I, I know I've worked with a lot of clients who would insist on four to five distinctive brand assets which might which might be helpful in brand recognition but not necessarily in terms of motivation and the, the Porsche example I, I gave is, is a classic one. Porsche has distinctive brand assets of the wazoo but none of those and you could talk about them until you blew in the face but but if people are afraid that their neighbours are going to think they're a wanker for buying one then they don't matter so I, I think you've got to be very careful in you know what you wish for on distinctive brand assets um, but um, the point about creatives and and logos and product, um, I, 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 I don't think in the book, and if I did say all creatives, I didn't mean to, um, and I shouldn't, because it's not true of all creatives. No, no, it's not. Yeah. Generally, the creative people I've worked with who get really bent out of shape about having to put the product in it, it shouldn't be working in the industry anyway and aren't very good and don't have very much confidence. So uh, th I, I used to work with this, a great creative director in London called John Webster. And he was actually the guy who wrote the, the Guardian commercial I showed you at the start. And I, I saw him speak at a conference once, and this young copywriter, in, a, in a, a slightly pointed and not too nice way, asked John why it was that John always had so much product and big logo in his advertising, as if somehow John was weak and had compromised. And John was a, he was a very mild-mannered, gentle kind of guy. And I was shocked when he turned around and he said, well, if you don't think that's important, you should fuck off and write scripts for the two Ronnies. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, like, what? Okay. I've, I've never seen the colour drain from somebody's face. But, but, you know, but John, like all the best creative people, love their work because of the tension. That, the, the creative people who don't like what they do and resist what they do don't like that juxtaposition of art and commerce. 
and the commerce messes with their art. What John and Jeff Goodby and Rich Silverstein and you know great creative people all over the world love is the juxtaposition of art and commerce. It, it's more of a challenge. And if you get it right, it's to be admired. And, and they know what they're supposed to do. They're, they're using art simply as a means to an end, not the end in itself. Um, okay, so uh, now um, uh, I'm going to talk about, so the biggest mistake both marketers and their agencies can make, people have said, is in thinking that they are the customer, and you've mentioned this earlier, so, um, or that they understand the customer and therefore they don't need to talk to any actual customers, so that's the biggest. And then the second biggest mistake is that they think that everyone cares about their brand just as much as they do. Um, they don't take into consideration the fact that, as you said, they spend eight hours a day, five days a week, inside this building, however many number of years, um, and that actually for the, what do you call them, not consumers, what do you call them? Real people. Um, <laughs> humans uh, may come across it sort of fleetingly, occasionally. So um, the question is, you know, what are your thoughts on this? Um, and do you think there's been a fundamental shift in the relationship between brands and consumers as a result of COVID? I'm going to start with the COVID thing first. I don't think COVID changes anything. I think smart brands have always understood their place in the world and have acted accordingly. Always have, always will. And whatever we think, it's changing everything. It's the new normal. Bollocks. People will go back to doing exactly what they did before once this COVID thing's over. Sorry. Um, so on, on the, 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 the problem about, um, about clients thinking that everybody's like them, I had a, a client at Nike, the late Jeffrey Frost, wonderful man, who had a phrase which he talked about them are us marketing, and that assumption that you know, everybody was the same as we were and is as into our products as we are. And I think that's by far the biggest and most common mistake that both marketers and agency people make. Now I, I had to brief a creative team in London once on a beer brand uh, there's a beer called Simmons Bitter that was um, a Welsh regional brand. <coughs> and I mean, I, I started my briefing and I pretty much got chucked out of their office. They're like, piss off, planner. We don't need you to tell us about beer. We know beer. We drink beer. I was like, yes, you drink beer from Nazi bottles of premium beer in your trendy Soho wine bars where they might have a beer or two. So that, that's not the same beer and that you're not the same drinkers. The guys who drink this in South Wales drink it at the end of a shift in the steel mill. They've been in front of the furnace all day, they're hot, they're thirsty, and they want a beer that's low in alcohol that they can drink in high volume. And you, you talk to these guys in the working men's clubs in South Wales, and they'll drink 10 to 15 pints of this in a session every night after work. And it's different. And, that, and I've always thought one of the most important jobs a planner has to do is act as a, a kind of interpreter because you've got creative people over here and you've got clients over here and you've got account people here and you've got the real people in their bars in Wales over here and they all speak a different language and they've all got different experience and it's your job to sit in the middle and find a way of allowing these people to communicate with each other. And, and the, the second mistake you mentioned, it, it's, it's equally common um, that, that clients will give a level of importance to their their product that doesn't actually exist in the real world. And it doesn't exist even, and I come back to Porsche again, you would think that when somebody owns a Porsche, they would revere this thing and, and worship it and you know think it was the greatest thing they'd ever owned in their lives, which for some people it may be. But what you know, you don't have to do too much research to realize that the majority of people who own Porsches also own other cars, some of which are better than the Porsche. So it's not that thing to be, to be worshipped. And, and, you know, we get served this delusion on a, on a daily basis, you know, as brands ask us to visit them on Instagram or join the conversation on Facebook. And I go, yeah, I would if you weren't a toilet cleaner or a hemorrhoid medication. <laughs> you know, just get real about the, the role that you play or potentially play in my life. You know, you're not that important. Um, now, the... The, the, one, the, other, the last campaign I wanted to show you related to this point, um, I think succeeded. It succeeded for many reasons, but I think the most important reason it succeeded was that the client who came to us with the problem 
understood the role of the product in people's lives. And it was a campaign for milk in California. You'll know it as the Got Milk campaign. But the very first meeting we had with the client, he said, I just want to get one thing straight with you from the start. He said, I don't think people think about milk a whole lot. I don't think anybody thinks it's important. I don't think anybody thinks it's interesting. If they think anything about it, it's dull. The only thing that's interesting about milk is what's consumed with it. So you don't, you, know, you don't pour yourself a bowl of milk and think, hmm, what cereal shall I put in that? <laughs> you know, it's always, you pour the cereal and then, then the milk, well, there's nothing else you can put on it, is there? Um, and we have this conversation about all the things that, that milk is typically, typically consumed with in America, be it peanut butter and jelly sandwiches or cupcakes or chocolate chip cookies or brownies, you know, all of which, yes, are more interesting than the milk. You, you get that relationship right. And he said, you know, my idea for a campaign, and I've always thought, by the way, that clients should have the first idea, and it's just then up to the agency to have a better one. Um, and, and for the client to be open enough to accept that that's an improvement, if, if indeed it is. But he said, my idea for the campaign is, is milk and something. And we said, well, it's a subtle distinction, but we disagree. We think it's something and milk. The focus should always be on the something, the peanut butter, the, the jelly sandwich, the brownie, the chocolate chip cookie. And then later on in our research, we said, actually, it's not something and milk that's interesting. It's something and no milk. We use the something to stimulate desire for milk, and then we take milk away. And once, the only time you think about milk is when you need it and you haven't got any. And that's what that campaign was all about. So you could show these two pieces of film, please. And that was the Vienna Wood Dance in D, one of my all-time favorites. And now, let's make that random call with today's $10,000 question. It's a tough one. Who shot Alexander Hamilton in that famous duel? All right, let's go to the phones and see who's out there. Mm -hmm. Hello, for $10,000, who shot... Mm -hmm. Excuse me? Mm -hmm. I'm afraid your time is almost up. I'm sorry, maybe next time. Got milk? You remember I, I said before there are some ads that just that you think are going to work initial testing implies they will and then they, they don't, just don't that second one was one of those all of the testing we'd done had been great and but that was basically me describing the ad to people as if I were telling a story to a bunch of mates in a pub um, when it was shot it became much darker and you know, it didn't have the music on it um, the original script didn't have that good, the bad and the ugly music on. Um, and it, it was just us, us realising that it, it had become too dark and people were reacting to it and going, well, that, that's kind of almost like a child abuse sort of thing. You know, it's, it's potentially violent. Call, call social services. Um, but then Jeff Goodby took it back into the cutting room, put the music on it, went back and forth between the eyes like the, like the spaghetti western gunfight and it was probably the most successful of any of the commercials we ran in that, that campaign. I love it. I love that the cat gets killed in the end. Um, <coughs> sorry, I love cats. I love you. Okay, you, you have to edit that piece of film. I can't remember the camera. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to move on to... Um, uh, less about the work, more about the people question. So what do you look for when you're hiring a planner? And do you have any um, advice for budding planners or people who are more seasoned in terms of you know, improving their craft? 
Um, all right, so if I'm hiring anybody, not just planners, I'm looking for interesting and interested people. Um, I need people who are going to be able to see something interested in the mundane um, and have a level of enthusiasm that's going to make other people interested in it as well. Um, I don't care what academic discipline they're from, although generally I preferred them not to be from an advertising or, or marketing background. Um, when I started my planning department at Goodby, I, I remember the, the first three people I hired were a journalist, a lawyer and a killer whale trainer. Um, well, I thought if she could get Shamu to do what she wanted it to, our creative department would not be an obstacle. Um, and, and, so it, and so it proved. I like people who listen more than they speak. Um, I like a personality that brings out the best in others. And I, I don't, planners don't have to have the good ideas, they just have to create an environment where other people can have them. Um, I need them to be chameleon-like in their range in their ability to create relationships of respect and trust. And I, I mean, I, what I mean by that, I remember one day when I was working in New York, I, had, I started my day with a breakfast with a creative team I happened to be traveling with, briefing them on a project. I then went for a meeting with my client at the National Basketball Association. So it was, I was meeting David Stern, the commissioner, who was one of the most sort of powerful people in world sport and American business. And then I went and did some focus groups on a, it, we were doing a, an AIDS awareness project where I, I had to interview in backstreet cafes people who were um, addicted to drugs and paid for their drug habit with prostitution. So I would have to pay their respondents fee to their pimp who would sit in the back of the cafe while I interviewed them. And that's a pretty extraordinary range of people to have to deal with in one day and I, I need planners to be able to operate across that sort of range. Um, I need them to be simplifiers. I think 98% of the world, 98% of the people in the world in general and in our business are complicators and I need simplifiers. People who can take, I, I mean I remember one, one guy came to work for me once and I said to him, I won't mention his name, it's a very distinctive name if he ever sees the film, but he, he, I gave him this pile of data and I said, can you summarize that for me? And he came back with a pile that thick. And, and it's typical of a certain type of thinking. Um, but most of all, and the, the, the two things that I wanted more than anything else, first of all, I wanted to be able to sit next to this person for 10 hours on a plane and for it to be interesting. I, I would never hire anybody. I didn't think I could sit next to on a plane for 10 hours. Uh, and that, that's actually a pretty good filter for any hiring decision. <laughs> um, and ultimately, I don't care how good they are at individual craft skills. Um, they have to be useful. And there were a couple of planners I worked with in San Francisco who, if you've written a little checklist of the attributes that, that good planners have to have, they probably wouldn't have been the best in my department on any one of those attributes. But somehow, miraculously, time and time again, every campaign they worked on was creatively brilliant and commercially effective. And just, just everything they touched. And it, it, it took me a long time to realize what was happening, because I thought there were certain shortcomings as planners, and there were certain things that frustrated me they weren't better at. Somehow they always got results and give me a useful person over a highly accomplished person any day. Oh, and sorry, you said advice for yes. panels. Um, don't leave a job too quickly. I think that the worst thing that people do is leave a job earlier than they should. You know, they let their ambition get the better of them. I've seen a lot of people you know, get to very high and important positions based on having stayed and being the last person standing in a company. Um, find your superpower and build on that. And everybody's got something they're really good at. You need to find what that is as early as you can and build your career on that. Make sure you're working in an agency that, that supports you and encourages you and gives you room to grow and if not, move agency. Um, and as for improving your craft, my advice, which doesn't go down too well with, with agency leadership sometimes, is, is to work less, get out more, and um, start a life more advertising. 
be much better at us being, at being a planner if you do those things. Sorry. My boss is in the room, thank you. Unlimited vacation for planners. <laughs> Okay, uh, so just kind of sticking with that. Um, so aside from being exceptional at your job and earning the respect of your peers and clients really early on, you also managed to build up a really large and successful planning department and you were still in your 20s. So my question is, how were you able to get the clients to value planning um, enough to grow revenue from it and therefore the department? Well, I wasn't, I wasn't always successful, right? When, in my first few months in the media department at BMP, my, um, my nickname was Bollock Brain, and that was not because I was successful. I <laughs> um, but but I, you know, I, I suppose I built my career by, by discovering very early on that there was something I was good at, as I said, and I, I managed to build a, a foundation on that. But I was also lucky to work with some people, or for some people, who were quite happy to give me opportunities that at the time scared the shit out of me. And I only later realized probably scared the shit out of them as well, because they put me in a position where if I'd failed, it would have been terrible, um, but I didn't. And in the 15 years I ran the WPP fellowship, my brief for any host company or, or line manager was always give this person more responsibility than you think they're capable of give them a level of responsibility that given they've only been in the business one year or two years seems kind of ridiculous, but I promise you they'll rise to it. And in that 15 years, I never once had a problem with somebody being given too much responsibility. The only problems I ever had were with people not being given enough and not being pushed hard enough. So I, I think that's a really important part of any sort of mentor-mentee relationship. Um, I built the department at, at Goodby by hiring kids straight out of college and training them to be planners in the context of that and the environment and the unique philosophy of that agency. So I built it from the ground up. I trained them myself to start with, but when the department became the sort of size and we had the number of clients that meant I couldn't do that anymore, I did bring in some senior people, but I also converted them from other disciplines. A lot of my best planners were converted account people. I've always liked account people becoming planners, if they're the right ones, because unlike a lot of planners who spend their lives with their heads up their asses in this sort of search for a greater intellect, um, account people have a practical streak in them. Like if a client says Thursday, they know it's Thursday. Um, and you know, by Thursday, the planners often are arguing about the brief still. So, so I, I like people to be practical. Um, and and I, I, you know, I, I built planning in that agency by introducing it solely on new business to start with. It's, you know, retrofitting it on existing accounts didn't seem like a great idea because it was like saying, it's broke, we need to fix it. Um, in time, the, the clients that didn't, I mean, so the, the new business clients would hire us as, as a planning agency and with a particular way of thinking and working. And if they weren't going to do that, then we didn't want to work with them. And I don't say that in any arrogant way. I, I think every agency should have a point of view and should have principles about the kind of clients it, it wants to work with. And at the end of every new business pitch we ever did, we used to run a series of slides that said basically you've asked us to jump through hoops for today's meeting and answer lots of questions for you, which we hope we've done. Now we've got some things we want to ask of you. Because these things, if you can't answer yes to these questions, we will never be able to produce the kind of work for you that you liked enough to put us on your pitch list. And, and, we're, and these are non-negotiable for us. If we're going to go into this relationship, we have to have them. Pause for dramatic effect. <laughs> Well, no, I was just thinking about, you know, how well that works in a smaller place, that's all. We, we were a smaller place at the time. But that, <clears throat> we started with those principles when we were a, a $30 million agency serving only San Francisco clients, and we retained them when we were more than a billion dollar agency. Well, that'd be very expensive. <laughs> <laughs> No, but I mean that they, they, they had to do with they, they had to do with um, 
the client's attitude to advertising and their belief in what it could do for them. We needed to know that they valued its potential contribution and you know they weren't just doing it for the sake of it but that they but but most important of all that if we were going to try to solve problems for them first of all we needed to be agreed on what the problems were you know because I look out at the advertising landscape today and I think there's a lot of elegant solutions to the wrong problems um, so we, we needed to be there right from the start and involved in their business enough to know what their problems were um, and then we had to have the freedom to work the way we wanted to work and needed to work in order to to best apply our strategy and, and creativity. Now there's a number of questions you need to ask up front and I, I think when um, there were a couple of questions that we're, we were maybe going to come to later about how to win new business, I think when any potential piece of new business comes along that small group of leaders in the agency need to get together and ask themselves, do we, do we want this business? Um, do we think that we can win? Do we have a realistic chance of winning? You know, can we do our best work for this client? And can we do it by being ourselves and not having to pretend to be somebody else? Um, if you answer those questions honestly, and if the answer is no to any of them, you shouldn't pitch. And in the years I worked at Goodby in San Francisco, over a 10-year period, we won 90% of the new business we pitched, you know, which is a little above the average success rate in new business. And people used to say to us, oh my God, you guys must be great at pitching. We weren't that great at pitching. What we were really good at was saying no to a lot of the opportunities that came our way. And we said no to four out of five invitations to pitch. We only pitched the stuff we believed we could win. We only pitched the stuff we wanted. We only pitched the stuff that we thought we could do great work on. Um, okay, conscious of wanting to, it, it sounds like this is going to be really good when we open it up. So um, I'll try and make it swift. Uh, so Peter Field, who spent a lot of time researching and also um, sort of educating marketers and agencies all over the world about the importance of having um, sort of a couple of different investment pools um, for an optimum value for money equation. So one is the brand and the other is the tactical campaigns. Um, I wondered if you can tell us a bit about your own experience of how an investment in brand um, drives the return on investment um, at tactical level. Well, I'm not, sure I'm, I'm not sure I entirely agree that you should have separate pools for, for brand and tactical campaigns. I, I'm not entirely sure that's what sort of Peter and Les and others mean, but I... And I, I don't think that branding and tactics should be mutually exclusive because in, in my career, I've generally helped create campaigns that do both simultaneously or are capable of carrying both. Um, I think there's a, in most cases, pure branding campaigns are an expensive luxury. Um, there are some people who've done it brilliantly and done it right. I, I, mean, I think when, when Apple did the um, the think different is to the crazy ones thing. That was it was absolutely the right time to do a brand campaign, and it was done for absolutely the right reasons. Um, but I think that brand campaigns, apart from those few exceptions, are an expensive luxury, and tactical work that's done outside of a brand campaign is unlikely to succeed. You know, if, if, if clients want a separate brand campaign or wanted a separate, sorry, wanted a separate tactical campaign, I would always try to create the tactical campaign in the context of the overall branding. To have separate campaigns is, is sort of ridiculous. But you've, you, you've got to be operating at both levels and there's a symbiotic relationship between the brand and the tactical activity. One should feed into the other and there should be a sort of positive feedback loop. Yeah, I think I may have worded my question um, in a confusing way. That's what I, I meant. That must have been a very confusing answer in that case. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks very much. We'll move on. Yeah, no, I meant more like there were, there's two different pots of money. One is set aside for brands specifically, but the idea being that, yes, um, the tacticals are very much aligned with the brand, but that the two, are, that brand uplifts the tactical. Sorry. That's made it all so much okay. clearer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Okay, that, uh, that's the end of um, that's the end of those. Um, I've got uh, 
just a couple of um, straight straight off the bat ones that you guys have provided. So um, the first one, what is the, the worst assumption a strategist can make? We've talked about that, is that everyone else thinks the same that they do. Um, but I also, I, I think there is another mistake a strategist can make, which is thinking they're the smartest person in the room and acting like it. Um, you, it's your job to make other people feel like they're the smartest people in the room. Um, any tips in managing short-term client expectations while still trying to focus on a long-term strategy for them? No. <laughs> no. It shouldn't be a distinction between the two. What is the best brand strategy that you have seen? And also, oh, shall I go straight into that? What measure of uh, effectiveness is most impactful when translating a successful delivery of brand strategy back to senior leadership and the board? Um, well, I, I think that the most, a lot of people talk about the Apple campaign and, and strategy. And, and I, I was lucky enough about a week after Steve Jobs came back to Apple to go and meet him with the partners in, in the agency. And he, he, he was two hours late for the meeting. He, he, we were bored shitless by a couple of his marketing people showing us all these graphs and stuff about all the things that were wrong about Apple. And, and Jobs finally sort of breezed into the room, didn't say hello. Um, the marketing guy said, oh, it's all right, Steve, we've been briefing him. And he said, well, I'm sure everything they've told you is shit. I'm going to tell you why this company is in deep trouble and what I'm going to do about it. And, and he, he, he's, he sort of strode over to this, this wall and started drawing squares on it. And I've probably just moved out of your camera. It's confusing everything, isn't it? <laughs> Still okay? How am I? <laughs> um, but he drew all these boxes on the wall and said, right, each of these boxes represents X million billion dollars of investment for this company and in research and development. And he said, and this morning I've killed this one, this one, this one, this one. I think there were 13 boxes on the wall and he blocked out nine of them. Sorry, 11 of them. And he said, the only two that are left are uh, the two products that I'm going to bet the future of this company on. One of them is called the iMac, and the other is the G4, I think it was at the time. And he said, and, and we have to succeed with these products in order to buy ourselves enough time to be able to launch some other great stuff that the team have, have come up with. Um, but it that isn't, isn't ready yet. And he said, the thing about these two is that they represent what Apple is and always has been at its absolute best, where the, they represent this unique and wonderful marriage of, of technology and design. Now, all he's done is draw up these two boxes and not cross them out. I was sitting there wanting a G4 and iMac, and everybody else in the room felt exactly the same way. And the sort of passion that with which he talked about it was absolutely infectious. And he said, Right, so I'm, I'm, I'm betting the future of the company on these two things, and I want you to create a campaign that, that thanks all the people who've stayed with us when everybody else said we were going out of business, and that, that, that allows me to tell them they're special. Now, that, that when Chiat Day produced a Here's to the Crazy Ones Think Different commercial, that's exactly what they were doing, and it's an example of what I said about the client has to have the first idea. I mean, it, it wasn't just a brief, it was a creative idea that came, came, from, came from him. And I remember us walking out of the room going, God, what a prick. We didn't like him at all. We said, we couldn't, couldn't work with him, but my God, we better buy stock in Apple. <laughs> now, I can't possibly call myself a planner, because did I buy stock in Apple when it was $13 a share? No. No. Would I be here now? No. <laughs> no, no, call me on my boat, I'll do a Zoom call, but, no, so, not. but that was a great strategy. I, I think Obama's strategy at, in his first election was, was brilliant, um, brilliant as a campaign, but, but not so brilliant in terms of people's satisfaction with his presidency. Hope, change, allowed people, you know, talk about um, complicit audience people were able to put themselves into that and think about what they were hoping for, what they wanted to change. And obviously, 60 million different versions of what people hoped for and wanted to change couldn't possibly be satisfied. Um, you know, Trump's campaign, when he was elected, was great. I'm not one of them. And everything that they say bad about me 
represents the conspiracy of the people who are like them. It was brilliant. Ev everything that went wrong for him was used by him. Um, and, you know, I, I think he's the lowest form of human life I've ever, ever seen. But he, as a campaigner, he's very strong, but was, was a lot better the first time around. Second time, he had a different competitive context. And what worked against Hillary, who was much easier to demonize, didn't work against, against Biden. But, but great strategy. Sorry, I could go on forever, I won't. <laughs> okay. Um, do you have any advice for winning business pitches? I do, but how, how long have we got? I, I mean, I, mean, I what's that? Okay, I mean, my, my, my greatest advice for winning new business is to ask yourselves those questions I talked about earlier. Thank you. Should we ask the audience? Yeah. Does anybody have any questions? Um, one of the good definitions of advertising that stay with me, or roles of advertising, is this notion that um, it's about creating a shared understanding of a brand amongst the general public. And in a much more fragmented time, it seems that that is just so much harder to do. And I don't know what my question is, other than just your opinion on, you know, we, because yeah, you know, I'm probably not that dissimilar in age, grew up in the UK, I remember all those amazing ads, but everybody saw them, no matter what age you were. And so, so there was that, again, that, that notion of common understanding. And I find it myself these days, somebody at the end of the year says, you know, what were the ads that sort of hit you this year? And I really have to think about which ads made an impact. And so it's just what then does that mean? What, what does that mean for that role of advertising that we used to know it in terms of shared understanding? And how does that go forward? Yeah, it, it's a lot more difficult, which is why I retired. Um, I just, I just, I just thought, oh, shit, I can't do this anymore. Um, oh, but there are, there are still shared experiences of brands, you know. If, but uh, everybody's been lamenting the death of television for a really long time, but it's still a pretty powerful medium, and and it's, I still think it's the one place where you can create that shared experience if you do it in the in the right shows at, at the right time. Um, but but I you know I agree with it. I've got no idea who said that and where they were. I can't see a damn thing. I don't, so I'm looking over here. The voice could have been coming from there because it's in the speakers. But um, but I, I you know I'm I'm with you. I was thinking tonight. Like what have I seen recently that I really admire or that's changed my relationship with the brand? And it's really difficult to think of anything. Um, but you know we don't we don't talk about the advertising in the way that, that people used to. Um, and even even those of us who work in the business don't talk about it. And I wind through breaks with the best of them. Um, but it's great advertising when one of my kids is around and say, Dad, stop, stop. You know, you've got to look at this one. You know, because then we're all choosing to pay homage to this particular piece of advertising. But, um, you know, but I like the Spec Savers campaign. That's about as consistent as it gets. Um, <laughs> I, I think that I saw a very interesting Heineken ad this week, which all, I don't know if you've seen it. It's, it's this the one that's obviously aimed at female beer drinkers, and I I spent most of it thinking, your strategy is showing, your strategy is showing, but the, but it was saved completely by the line at the end where it goes, men drink cocktails too. It's brilliant, great twist. Um, so, but that that's about the only thing I've seen in the last few months where I've thought, oh, you know, I wish I'd had something to do with that. Um, but you know, you, it's up to you guys. Have, you, you've got the opportunity to. Now, I can't do it anymore. I'm just, I'm just sitting dully and passively at the other end of the television. But no, nobody. I don't. You know, it's it's hard to create a brand in those small fragments of media. Um, and, but, and we've all got these little devices now in our brains that that cut out the stuff that doesn't concern us. So I cut out most of it because it's crap. And then I don't see the rest of it because it's not aimed at me. So. Yeah, <laughs> oh, this is great. I can see you. <laughs> How did you uh, get sued by a dog? Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. I have um, to know. <laughs> Well, the first edition of my book 
um, Truth Lies and Advertising had a, a still from a Polaroid commercial on the cover. Now, I was absolutely anal about getting all of the legal permissions necessary for this book. I, you know, I, I was going to dot every I and cross every T. And I got, if you, if you look in the book, you'll, there's, there are page after page of permissions for photographs that I put in there and clips from commercials. And I got the acting talent's permission. I got the director's permission. I got the photographer's permission. I got the agency. I got the client, everybody. I asked about the picture of the dog on the front cover and the agency lawyer said under such and such amendment law you don't need to get a dog's permission because it's a dog. <laughs> so I didn't get the dog's permission. About six months after the book was published I got served for, for violating and threatening this dog's celebrity status <laughs> by using, and it's funny now, Right, and I, but it, and I thought it was funny when I first got it, and everybody in the agency thought it was hilarious. But it ended up costing me 10 grand at the time to make this thing go away. Because, as the lawyer said, in the end, this guy's suing you for 100 grand, he's suing Polaroid for 100 grand, he's suing the agency for 100 grand, he's suing God knows who else. And you have to settle out of court. And to settle out of court will cost you 10 grand. Um, to go to court will cost you several times that. So I had to settle. So I was successfully sued by a dog. The dog's life was only insured for 10 grand when it did the shoot. We could have, we could have killed it that day. As, as, as I now wish we had. Um, you know, so the dog's dead now. It has to be. It can't possibly be still alive. But, but anyway, yeah. I'm probably the first person you've ever met who's been sued by a dog. Um, I just had a question about, from your time in advertising, how have you seen um, representations of different people and different groups shift? And do you think that today it is a very active part in strategy that that's considered? And do you think it's done well? Um, I suppose I've, I've seen a lot of changes in it over the time I worked in the business. I don't think it's always done well. I think it's, it's often done sort of unnaturally and in, an, in a forced way. Um, and I, I mean, I, I, I think it, it should be a part of every strategy to, to represent society as it is, um, not some sort of ancient notion of what it you know, what once was. Um, but I, you know, it's not always done well. Um, you've mentioned purpose as one kind of, I guess, modern principle that sometimes you roll your eyes at or sort of takes people the wrong way. What's the other, or what's another big one in your mind of like a contemporary marketing principle that gets bandied around a fair bit right now that whenever you hear it, you just roll your eyes and think they've completely lost the plot in marketing if they're, if they're sort of um, drinking that Kool-Aid? Well, I, honestly, I, it, it's hard to get past the, the purpose one. Um, and everybody seems to need a purpose, and everybody seems to need a social purpose. And you know, I'm as social purposeful a guy as you'd meet. And you know, and, and I'm an environmentalist, and I'm a conservationist, and I love all that stuff. And you know, I'm, I'm a climate change activist, and I've worked. I spent years of my life working on that stuff. But um, I think people confuse purpose and social purpose. I think every brand should have a purpose. Um, every brand should have a reason for being. I just don't think that purpose has to be social in nature. Um, Nike's purpose is winning. Apple's purpose has to do with creativity and beautiful design. Um, companies with purpose also have uh, an enemy. You know, because And the enemy is the opposite of what they stand for. But, you know, what's interesting about Apple's purpose and enemy is that their enemy isn't IBM, their enemy is ugly design and illogical interface. Nike's enemy isn't Adidas, it's mediocrity. And I, I think when people in the company get that, it, the, the, the company is so much more powerful as a result. Ev everybody is moving in the same direction. I worked with Nike for years and, I mean, it, it, was, it was palpable 
point, the moment you walked onto their campus or the moment you walked into a meeting with them, that this was a company that was obsessed with sport and obsessed with winning. And, and I love that about them because it made, it made your life so much easier. They're very demanding, a really difficult client to work with. But, but you, know, you, you knew the ground in which you were, on which you were operating, the battlefield you know, for what, what you were doing. Um, and I, and I, the thing that, I mean, I, I do think people have lost the plot, and I think it every night when I'm exposed to advertising, because people just are reveling in the irrelevance um, in order to promote, you know, some sort of socially wonderful message about themselves. I mean, do good things, treat people well, you know, support charities, support you know, initiatives, but, but don't you don't have to associate them with your hemorrhoid medication. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I keep using the, the, hemorrhoid, the hemorrhoid guy. <laughs> He's 59. <laughs> okay, so that um, concludes this evening. Um, I just wanted to say a few thank yous. So, um, to our speaker, John, um, I think I could have listen to you all night. I looked at the time and didn't realise it was like 10 to 8 and I was just totally captivated. So thank you so, so much for taking the time to talk to us tonight. I think you deserve a huge round of applause. Um, thanks to Dave and Lara who manned the registration table. Um, they're the jump starters from last year and I just keep using them over and over again, so thank you. Um, Samilka, a very, very special thank you um, for being such a proactive and passionate APG member and representative for WA. Um, this whole night was Samilka's baby from the idea. She sent out surveys, emails, she did presentations, texts, you name it, she did it. You really have outdone yourself and thank you so much on behalf of all of us. Um, there is a small token of thanks, but I won't get you to do the walk of shame to come and collect it. I'll give it to you afterwards. So thank you. Thanks to Samilka. And finally, I was thinking to myself, um, what would be a suitable gift for someone like you, John? Um, someone of your stature. Uh, there is probably nothing I could give you, but I did think of something. Um, somehow, a cheap bottle of wine was not going to suffice. No offense, Mocha, okay, that's what you're getting. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, I know that you'll agree with me that nothing says thank you quite like a baby elephant. So, we adopted one for you for a year. Um, so this is Kandani. She's a two-year-old elephant from Nairobi. She was rescued at one week old. She survived drowning, disease, and she was airlifted to safety. And she's been in the Sheldrick Wildlife Trust um, Rehabilitation Program since. So please accept this not-so-small token of our appreciation. Um, and there's a lot of people, as we know, in need, and COVID sucks, and lots of people, you know, charities need our help. But if you really are struggling to buy something for someone this Christmas or any time of the year, um, you can actually adopt one yourself for as little as $70. You can adopt and name an elephant, giraffe, or rhino. So head to the shelteredwildlifetrust.org for more info. Uh, it's not so much about the gift that keeps on giving, but the gift that keeps on living. Um, thank you everyone for coming along this evening. Um, please feel free to join us for one last drink if you've got time. We have run a little bit over, so thank you so much, but I think it was definitely well worth it. Um, and don't forget to validate your parking tickets, as I mentioned. Um, and if you, do, if you don't stick around, please drive safely, and let me be the first to say, have a Merry Christmas, everyone. Thank you.